Fujika Kanaoya, Neem Cassandra Spade and Dishnikaz, Mishkigo Gamang and Donji, Namain Dodem, a Kuchiching Ishkanaganing and Giji on Bikai. Hello, everyone. My name is Cassandra Spade. I'm from Mishkigo Gamang First Nation and I come from the Sturgeon Clan. Today, we're focusing on lesson number two of the Indigenous Grassroots Activism Unit. The focus today will be situating ourselves in our communities and asking our questions about how are we related to our communities, what are our roles, and what are our responsibilities to our communities. Then we will talk about core values and really start to think about what fuels our activism and what gives us energy and what we are passionate about. Lastly, we're going to talk about two different approaches to community development, which are ultimately approaches to activism or wanting to create change in our community. So we will talk about the asset-based approach and a deficit-based approach. At the same time, we're going to be making those connections to the previous lesson, where we talked a lot about the power of place, honoring our lived experiences, and honoring storytelling in activism. So in saying that, we're going to do a brief refresher on community and different levels of activism. You may remember from last lesson, we talked about three different types of communities. We talked about communities that are in geographic areas, so things like a reservation, a town, or a city. We talked about communities that are of shared identity, so people who identify as women are part of a larger community of women, or people who identify as men are a part of a larger community of men. And to go further, people of diverse genders are part of a community of diverse gendered people or third gendered people. And so these are the shared identities. Those are communities built on shared identity. Lastly, or thirdly, we talked about a community that comes together from a collective goal or a shared interest or a shared attitude. So we can think of activist groups that come together that want to advocate for change in the community and that's their shared interest is creating that change. So all of these different types of communities we recognize that we are part of many, many communities, and they also operate on different levels or different levels of activism. So last lesson, we talked about the grassroots level as being the most local and the most uh, connected to our community level. If we take a step up from the grassroots, we go to the regional, and so it gets a little bit larger. You can think of things like Anishinaabeaski Nation, which is a politic body that looks at the two thirds of Northern Ontario and advocates for indigenous needs and indigenous communities. So it is not just our communities, our home communities, but it gets a little bit bigger and it's a regional. Next, from the regional, we can look at the national. And so we can think about this in a couple different ways. We can think of the, of the national as Canada as a whole with all the provinces and the territories, and this is a national level. So it can be different nations and countries that we see. We can also think of the national as our indigenous nations. So we can think of the Ojibwe uh, regions as the national level. We can think of Ojukri, the Cree, Algonquin, Diné. So there are many different ways to think of the national or a nation or a country. It's just, we recognize that this level is a little bit larger than the regional. And so lastly, we can look at the international, which is the entire world coming together. And so a good example of this is the International Indigenous Year of Indigenous Languages at the United Nations. And this is when Indigenous groups all over the world come together and they advocate for the importance of Indigenous languages. And we see that the entire world is participating in this level of activism. They are bringing it from their home communities, going through the regional, the national, and coming to the international. So you may already notice that all of the different communities that we are a part of, and all of the different types of communities that we are a part of can operate at all of these different levels of activism. Our focus throughout this unit is the grassroots. So how do we maintain a close connection to our local communities, how do we make change that is most meaningful and reflective of our local community? And what does our activism look like at the grassroots level? 
understanding that our grassroots activism can also take us to many, many different places. So our overview for today is activism and the power of place. We're gonna look at situating ourselves in our communities. What does it mean to be a part of our community? What is our role in our community? Then we'll move on to core values. So what fuels our activism? What do you value? What is important to you? What are you passionate about? What gives you energy? And lastly, we'll look at those two different approaches to community development or activism. And those are the asset-based approach and the deficit-based approach. So in situating ourselves in our communities, first we are asking our questions, what does it mean to be in a community? And what are my responsibilities, my obligations, and what is my relationship to the community? And in asking this, you also have to think about the interconnectedness. So what is the community's relationship to me? Because when we think of interconnectedness, we understand that we have a relationship to all beings and all beings have a relationship to us. And this is built on reciprocity or reciprocal relationships, things that are giving and taking equally. So when we situate ourselves in our communities, we immediately understand that we have a relationship to our community. We are interconnected to it. And so in understanding ourselves, it's one and the same in understanding our communities, understanding that we are made up of histories and stories and values, different identities, the many, many identities, our families and so on. And the same is said for our community. So once we recognize that our community is part of us and we are part of our community through interconnectedness, we remember that situating ourselves is always honoring the places where we come from and really recognizing the power of place and the power of self in our communities. So moving forward in understanding our core values and understanding what fuels our activism and what guides us, a core value is something like a fundamental belief or an understanding, a value, a personal value. It could be a community value, but a core value guides your decisions. So this is really foundational for activism. And I will give you an example of my own activism. For me, my core value is identity. So the importance of being able to identify the way in which you exist in the world and the way you see the world and the way you interact in the world, it is so important in understanding who you are. And so for a long time, many Indigenous people in Canada could not identify as Indigenous people. And if they did identify, there was a lot of guilt or shame, or there was stereotypes and discriminations pushed onto them. And so what is so important to me in identity is understanding that where we come from and who we are is so unique and important and brilliant and resilient. So identity is so essential to, to building communities and building communities that are proud and people who have pride in who they are. And identity fuels all of my work. It fuels my work in language, it fuels my work in education, and it fuels my work in working with youth. So other examples could include uh, you really value learning and education, so growing, and perhaps your activism focuses on developing curriculum or working in schools or changing schools, reimagining them, uh, land-based education, cultural education, uh, your need for always learning. That could be something that fuels you. Or perhaps what is really important to you is relationships and communication. So developing relationships with people that are meaningful and that are heartfelt and having those connections to people so that you can communicate really complex issues. So creating strong relationships is what fuels your activism. At the same time, we can think of many other core values like family, respect, local, community, and so on. We can even think of things like language, many different examples, such as core, the value of the local and the community, respect, mutual understanding, caring, knowledge, family, and the list goes on. 
there's really so many different things that you could value. And so what is important is taking the time and to reflect what gives me the most energy, what am I passionate about, and what keeps me awake at night. I've often heard of elders asking me, if it doesn't keep you awake at night, then you're doing something wrong. So when I'm going to sleep and I'm getting ready, I'm always thinking about my work and what gives me energy and how I, I participate in activism because the work that I'm doing is very important to me. And so I want to make sure that I'm doing good work. So when we think of situating ourselves and our core values, next we move on to our approaches in community development. And what community development is, is when community members come together and they self-organize and they want to create action around a specific issue. So they want to create change and they want to change their communities in ways that are reflective of their values and what they want to see. And this is very similar to activism. When people come together and they self-organize and they advocate for change. So community development can be seen as hand in hand or goes hand in hand with activism and that they are both wanting to create change in the community. However, when we think of community development and activism, we have to think of our approach. So this is about how we're thinking, how we're understanding and our knowledge we have around our communities and the activism that we're doing. So this is thinking about how are we doing our activism? How are we understanding the work that we're doing? And what is our knowledge that fuels this work? And so it's very important to think about how we are doing things and why we are doing them. And so that leads us into understanding two different types of approaches to activism. So this, so this leads us to two different approaches, an acid-based approach and a deficit-based approach. And each of these approaches addresses a problem in a community or a community need. However, it does so in very different ways. So let's look at the acid-based first. An acid-based approach is when you focus on the skills and the strengths, the materials and resources that you have in your community. You recognize all the things that already exist and you think of opportunities and the possibilities and the things that you wish and want to see in your community. So this approach is about building on all of the things that already exist in your community and creating something new and something reflective. And so when we think of this, we can think of, let's say, let's use the example of not having a high school in your community or my community. And so an acid-based approach would look at the problem of not having a high school in the community. And then it would start to think about how do I approach this problem? Well, I have a school in my community that I could use. I have teachers in my communities. The students could live with their families. So there's already housing for the students in the communities and there's land for students. We also have transportation, we have materials, we have a library and so on. So already you start to see that we're building upon the things we already have. However, there is no high school program. So the acid-based approach would build on the things that already exist and think about how do I implement a high school program and, and what resources and things do I have available to me to do that? So it, this approach is very much focused on possibilities and opportunities and imagining and creating. Now let's take a look at the deficit-based approach. And this approach is very much focused on problems and needs of communities. It focuses on the things that are missing and what we don't have. And often we can start to think of a problem and it can start to snowball and it can start to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the focus is on the problem instead of creating something new or solving the problem. So an example, if we take the high school that we don't have in the community, we might think, oh, there's no high school classrooms, there's no high school teachers, there's no high school curriculum, there's no high school gym classes, and, and it goes on and on and on. And we start to see that we are just trying to address the problem and fill in the gaps or fill in what's missing, and we're not really reimagining it or creating something. And at the same time, when we focus so heavily on problems, 
we can get weighed down by the problems and we can feel like problems are really big and we can't do very much to address them. And so a deficit-based approach is focusing on the things that we lack. So when we use these two different approaches in activism, I like to use an asset-based approach. However, this is not to say forget about problems because problems exist in our communities and problems are complex and they're pervasive they're in your face and problems are there. Problems exist in all communities. However, when we use an acid-based approach, we are addressing the problem in a way that we can get rid of the problem and create something. We can create something that's reflective of who we are. Whereas if we focus on a deficit-based, the problem can get bigger and bigger and bigger. Or when we address the problem, we're just filling the gaps and meeting, meeting the bare minimum. We're not really thinking about opportunities and possibilities. And so these are very different approaches to activism. At the same time, when we think of an asset-based approach versus a deficit-based approach, we can apply this in the community, but we can also apply it to ourselves. And so for a very long time, as I was growing up, I often use a deficit-based approach when I thought of myself. I thought of all of the things that I was lacking, all of the training I needed, all of the skills I didn't have, and all of the just experience that I hadn't had. And so I was constantly minimizing my lived experience and who I was. And I was constantly focused on the things that I didn't have, I lacked, I was missing. And so that really pushed me into a place of not feeling like I could create change or that I had power in who I was. Whereas when I started to use an asset-based approach and I started to recognize all of the assets that I have in myself, all of the strengths, the skills, the knowledge, the lived experience, I started to think of myself very differently. I started to see that I'm a good writer, that I can speak in public, that I am a good reader, that I have all of these things to offer. And this could range in so many different things. If you're, if you're artistic, you like sports and you're good at sports, you are funny, you're caring, you're kind, you're, you're academic, you theorize a lot of things. And so there are so many skills that we all have and there's so much knowledge that we have. And then I started to think about where I come from and my family and all of the knowledge that they have given me and passed on to me. And I started to think that I actually come from a very unique place of being and that I have my indigenous language and my family who are Anishinaabe Muin speakers. And I have a family who has all this cultural knowledge and hunting knowledge and things like that. And so I started to use an acid-based approach to look at myself. And I started to feel very different about myself. And I started to feel capable and I had power and I was able to do things that I didn't before. And so when we think about these two approaches, they can apply to community development, they can apply to activism, but they can also apply to us because we are assets in our communities. We have a lot of things to offer. And, and so in saying that, an asset-based approach can be used in so many different ways. And the ways that I use it are, are to look at myself and see what I have to offer my community because I have a lot to offer and so do you. In summary of today's lesson, we talked a lot about our lived experiences and situating ourselves in our communities. We did this from by working from places of power and recognizing that our communities have power and that we are connected to our communities and we have power. So understanding who we are and understanding where we come from gives us a lot of power in that we are each unique and come from diverse places. Next, we look at situating ourselves and asking ourselves what are our relationships to our communities? What are our responsibilities, obligations, and roles? And when we situate ourselves in our communities, we can develop solutions in ways that are most reflective of our communities and ourselves. And that led us into core value and core values. So understanding what fuels our activism, what gives us energy, what are we passionate about, and what guides our decision making. And I shared with you my example in that my core value is identity. Lastly, we looked at community development and different approaches. And these approaches apply to activism too. We looked at an asset-based approach, 
which recognizes all of the things that already exist in our communities, looking at the materials, the resources, the skills, strengths, and from those things, think of the possibilities and the opportunities and the things that we can reimagine in creating communities that are most reflective of us. And so an asset-based approach addresses a problem in a way that creates from the problem and creates a solution that can work to really change the community and create meaningful change. And then we looked at a deficit-based approach, which is about thinking of the things that lack, the things that are missing, the things that are not there, and really thinking about a problem which can get bigger and bigger and bigger and start to feel like too much. Or we start to think of problems and we only think of filling the gaps. So just meeting the bare minimum and not really reimagining. We're just focused on problems. We also recognize that problems are very complex issues and very complex things. And these approaches are not about forgetting that problems are there or forgetting that problems exist. It's about addressing or approaching a problem in a way that changes how we're gonna make meaningful change in our community. So different approaches to that. And we also understand that all communities have different solutions. So the solution to my community is going to be very different from your community. And that's because we come from all very unique and distinct places of being. And that relates back to working from places of power in that the communities we come from have so much power and so do we. So in saying that, I say thank you, miigwech, and I will see you in lesson three.